delighted to welcome Kate Doyle, um, who's, who's our speaker now. Kate specializes in, in studying experimental music and sound in visual performance art. Her work is truly interdisciplinary, ranging between musicology, art history, and communication theory. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to everyone involved in this wonderful symposium, and special thanks to Joe and to Gabriella. Let's start with a few seconds of listening. That was an excerpt from Rachel Berwick's May Pore. Can you hear me if I move here? May Pore, a piece that she began in 1997. So Berwick, who is primarily a glass sculptor at the Rhode Island School of Design, um, she was inspired by a record of the German uh, naturalist Alexander von Humboldt, who in the late 18th century um, traveled up the Orinoco River in Venezuela and came across a tribe that had days earlier basically extinguished um, a neighboring tribe called the Maypore. And this tribe took the Maypore's parrots, which were kept as pets, and um, when Humboldt came across the tribe he found, uh, they presented him with a parrot as a, as a gift. So Humboldt was listening to his parrot and uh, singing, and he realized that the parrot was not singing. The parrot was speaking the language of the now deceased tribe. And so Hummelt uh, recorded the parrot's speech phonetically, and there are records of this. Um, and Berwick came across those records and began with um, another woman who is um, b basically sort of an animal trainer to, um, to teach two parrots uh, May Pore. And, and then she created an installation. Um, so you, she, um, uh, you can hear this, these parrots speak May Pore in the space of the gallery. So I bring up Berwick's project because it not only uh, resurrects the sound of a lost language, but it also draws attention to the role of sound in our historical consciousness. And today I'm going to talk about four artists who began work in the 1950s and 60s um, who similarly draw attention to sound um, as a, an aspect of our historical consciousness, but also use sound as a way to access our consciousness as artists, as community members, and as communicators. So of course, at the mid 20th century, um, sound, language, and performance were primary tenets of um, much art made in, in that we come to know now as new art practices. So of course we have projects like um, Cage's New School class, um, and I, I, won't, I will mention that I don't put this up there to say that all things came from this source because that, that's just not the case, but it, is, it was an important place of collaboration at which sound was at the, the very center. We also have um, language prose scores, seen here uh, George Brecht's drip, uh, score for drip music. Brecht was a, a member of Cage's class. And this score provides an important model um, for a new kind of musical score in which um, instructions are translate or are instructed via prose rather than traditional notation. And then of course, as we've talked about today, um, we have uh, numerous instances of performative activities um, of which women were truly the exemplary pioneers. I should also mention, though, that in other disciplines, um, specifically the discipline of linguistics, um, a number of scholars were reacting against um, Chomsky's largely performance-divorced theory of transformational grammar so at the mid-century. So 
Um, here are pictured three scholars working really um, beginning in the 60s, but really in the 70s and 80s, who emphasize the, the performance of language in everyday language production, um, and also in the production of language um, in um, mother-infant interactions. So I've attempted to set a, a very, a very brief context for understanding the work of four artists that I'll discuss, who I'll discuss today, Meredith Monk, Pauline Oliveros, Yoko Ono, and Hannah Darboven, whose repertoires, I feel, reside exactly at the intersection of sound, language, and performance. We can understand these artists, um, the way that these artists use sound in relationship to language and consciousness in a number of ways. So in their work, sound can be used to replace traditional linguistic forms. It can be used to access alternative modes of consciousness. Um, sound can be understood as a concept. And sound can be used to represent language production processes. So I'll start with Monk, who uses sound to create communicative structures not based on traditional lexicon and grammar. She came to New York in the mid-1960s. She had studied operatic singing and dance at Sarah Lawrence, and she um, became um, assimilated into experimental music circles um, in New York. She was good friends with James Tenney, and um, who was mentioned earlier, uh, Carolee Shaneman's uh, uh, partner at one point. And um, she also, um, met a number of people who performed regularly at the Judson Church. So from the late 1960s on, Monk began to create dramatic pieces um, that were often intended to relay a narrative, um, but without lexicon, so no words, just uh, vocables, vocal syllables. Um, she explains her composition as both a language and an archaeology, as a way to access quote, the pre-logical and primordial consciousness, end quote. But we can understand her vocal gestures in part by comparing them to the sonic structures that are found in pre-verbal conversation. So oftentimes, um, pre-verbal conversation is associated with parent-infant communication before infant language acquisition. Um, but, but basically, they are structures that are conversant um, but they relay information, emotional information, not through morphemes, not through words, but, but through prosody and timing. So I'll give you one example uh, by drawing out an excerpt from Dolman Music. Um, there's a still from Dolman Music here in which um, uh, Monk and several other members of her vocal ensemble are seated either in a circle or in a semicircle, as you'll see later. So this is a... Um, transcription of the score that I made, I should mention that Monk does not traditionally notate her scores. These pieces come out of work with her vocal ensemble in rehearsal. So I've made, I've made this transcription, but it's just for the purposes of our viewing. Um, and there's also no need to, to read music here. Um, if you just look at the topography of the line, you can see that one voice part eventually mimics the other by looking at the rise and fall of the line. So basically what, what I'm arguing that this is, is um, these are examples of sympathy or mirroring at a key component of preverbal conversation. So let's listen to a moment of this here, and I'm gonna pull this up separately, and see if you can hear some of these sympathetic structures.
studied meditation and improvisation. And so in the um, late 1960s, early 1970s, she formed, she formed this group, um, her group that was an all women's group that had practiced improvisation exercises. So there's all there was there with her accordion sort of in the back, center right. And Oliveros developed exercises at this time, and she published them in 1974 under the title Sonic Meditations. So in this book, we find exercises for close listening, attention to sound, and communication through sound-based and nonverbal means. So I'll show you one um, score, one exercise from Sonic Meditations. This is Pacific Tell. Um, in which Oliver else instructs, find your place in a darkened indoor space or a deserted outdoors area. Mentally form a sound image. Assume that the magnitude of your concentration on or the vividness of this sound image will cause one or more of the group to receive this sound image by telepathic transmission. Visualize the person to whom you are sending. Rest after your attempted telepathic transmission by becoming mentally blank. When or if a sound image different from your own forms in your mind, assume that you are receiving from someone else, then make that sound image audible. Rest again by becoming mentally blank or return to your own mental sound image. Continue as long as possible or until all others are quiet. Sonic meditations laid the groundwork for Oliveros' later theory of deep listening. Um, in which she would distinguish hearing, a physiological process, from listening, a cognitive process. But it's interesting to note that in the 1960s, Yoko Ono had similarly distinguished between um, mental and physical listening in her work. So Ono had studied music, uh, composition. She began um, university in Japan studying philosophy, but then came to Sarah Lawrence in New York and studied, she studied composition in the style of the 12 tone series, as like Schoenberg and Fabian. Um, but then um, her teacher basically told her, you know, you're doing experimental things, so you need to, you need to go to New York City, basically, and, and explore what those people there are doing. And so she did. And um, she, um, she became associated with Cage's class, um, in part due um, to the participation in that class of her then husband, who was a um, Japanese composer and experimental musician at Juilliard. Um, but in 1960, she created um, a series of pieces, and they were actually displayed in 1961. They were shown in 1961. And this series um, featured works accompanied by prose or event style Scores. But the interesting thing is that Yoko performed many of them herself at the gallery, and also she read the scores aloud. So she conveyed them via oral transmission. They were not just visual, they were oral as well, and aural. So she, she performed these scores, and she performed them by sounding language. So Ono performed a lot at this time in, 19, in the early 19th in New York, she performed at Carnegie Hall, and then she went to Japan and gave uh, many performances there. And by 1964, right before she would return to the United States, she, she self-published the book called Grapefruit, which was a compilation of her scores at the time. So many of these scores are, like Oliveros' exercises, for attention to sound. This is the first score in um, Grapefruit, and it al is also, Grapefruit distinguishes between um, events, painting, um, and music. There are specifically music scores in Grapefruit, and this is the first of them. Secret Piece, which she, writes, which she wrote beginning in 1959. And Odo's, Odo calls for uh, the performance of a, a long-held tone or drum, basically, except she also instructs for that note to be played with accompaniment, specifically the accompaniment of the natural world. So the woods at dawn, or you can see where she's written in here, 
the accompaniment of the birds singing at dawn. So not only is this a score that instructs for um, a sort of radical kind of performance, but it is also a, a radical take on listening.
number and calendar dates that structure her conceptual procedure transform into sonic gestures and phrases, much in the way that numbers become physical gesture in her writing work. So Darbovin's continuous, continuously writing on becomes replaced by the continuously going on of the basis or the performer. Darbovin, in some ways, reverses the procedure of Ono schools. Rather than the movement of material listening to music of the mind, Darbovin takes us from serial concept to sonorous manifestation. Monk, Oliveros, Ono, and Darbovin challenge boundaries of musical composition, communication, language, notation, and listening practice. By exploring sound as a communicative process and as a conceptualizing process, they revolutionize what it means to compose music, to transmit aesthetic, intellectual, and emotional information, and to express oneself in sound. When we take 